few stream yards. <laughs> well, let's go tweet out that we're live. I was going to say, yeah, if you want to do that, I'll send it out. Yep, here we go. Fantastic. So it has been tweeted out. And I know that the audio is working because I just heard my terrible voice. So now we can get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Prudent Reads, the wonderful based and reactionary book review show that you can only find here on this channel. I am the Prudentialist, and I am joined with a very special guest, Aaron McIntyre. Aaron, how are you? How's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm glad that we could finally make this happen. I know that we had talked about going over Spangler for a while, and then you had a wonderful life news IRL, and then I started actually reading the damn thing and realized that this was a lot more complex and in-depth than I was anticipating, so I'm glad that we finally got around to it. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, that being said, well, we got everyone pouring in now. Um. So for those of who are thinking that we're going to go over both volumes today, unfortunately we're not. It's only going to be volume one, which I think is the more important one to cover when we're talking about sort of Spangler's view of history. Um, we are going over volume one, Form and Actuality, which is the sort of theoretical, metaphysical, and almost, I could say, ontological basis for how Spangler views history. And it covers a wide variety of both you know, philosophical concepts, the classics, and a perspective in which to view history that was typically not taught in history classes. And as someone who has a history degree, I can guarantee you that they're not teaching it now. Um, so in, even when they do, it's merely brought up as a footnote and they reference more modern scholars like Huntington who are more influenced by Spangler than other people as well. So with that being said, hello everybody. We're glad that you're all coming in and just starting there. Um, but I'll start with you, Aaron. What did you think of Volume 1, Form and Actuality? When did you first, you know, hear of Oswald Spangler, and when did you first started reading him? You know, I, I'd heard of Spangler pretty often. I'd heard people say, you know, uh, you know, uh, cyclical history and, and tied to Oswald Spangler, but I never really understood, you know, really any in depth or any of the ideas attached to it until you know last year and a half or so when i started uh, you know seeing more on kind of what spangler had talked about and then uh i guess it's been probably eh, about eight months ago i really like dug into the works uh and and uh read both volumes uh and uh, i was very impressed i thought they're they're very interesting spangler has a very different style, which I'm sure we'll get into, but it's, it's totally different from an academic historian, which turns a lot of people off um, because they're, they're picking up and expecting that. Uh, but I do think that it, it's an excellent uh, approach to kind of a theory of history and, and, and looking at uh, cultures and uh, brings a lot of things forward that you wouldn't get from a purely academic uh, analysis of history. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a big fan myself. Yeah, I mean, since making, you know, content and started getting more in depth on the more reactionary side of the political sphere, and Spengler's been mentioned a lot. And in fact, I was told that I needed to read him as soon as I started reading Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, because Huntington was clearly influenced by him. So I picked up both volumes from Rogue Scholar Books, and if this, I'm not sponsored by them, but if you are interested in reading more esoteric and traditional based literature and history, you should go check out Rogue Scholar Books. You can find them at Rogue Scholar Press on Twitter. So you should definitely um, go ahead and get you guys uh, yourselves a copy. And if not, you can always find it online. And if you're more of an audiobook guy, there's a gentleman by the name of Mr. Maxwell House with like 162 subscribers who is doing an audio reading of the entire book of both volumes. So go ahead and find that kid on YouTube. He's doing a great job. Um, but no, for me, reading the book, I was beyond just, I was blown away by the level of historical understanding that he had. Uh, for context, this book came out near the end of the First World War. The first volume comes out in 1918, although Spangler originally comes up with sort of this cyclical concept of history around 1912, 1911, um, at least based upon some of his earlier work and his conversations with academics. But... Um, 
his grasp of history and not just like Western European history and the classics, but an understanding of uh, ancient Chinese history, ancient Indian history, the Mesopotamia and Egypt in Egypt to me was really just, wow. The, the guy really knows his stuff. Um, and on top of that, the fact that, you know, Spangler's life is relatively unknown. Uh, we don't know too much about him. He only lived into his fifties, died of a heart attack in, in the 1930s. And, he lived off disability due to some sort of chronic back pain and was a high school teacher and wrote these books. And this is what he's known for along with a few other works as well. Um, but the most important thing that we'll start off with, I think when we're talking about decline of the West, especially with volume one is, is that the immediate departure from traditional understandings of world history. Um, so throughout the first part, well, throughout the book and throughout other, you know, commentaries that, have been made on Spangler is that Spangler talks about the traditional concept of history to be what he calls like Talmudic history. So in, refer in reference to the Talmud in reference to the Torah, um, how history is divided into categories and that they're static based upon the perspective of the observer of their time. And so he's immediately criticizing the sort of like end of history, end of civilizational like viewpoints that we see of traditional scholars. When we talk about things like, Oh, you have the, classical period you have the you know dark ages the enlightenment the early modern era to what we now would consider the modern era the modern day um and spangler refutes this by saying that um history in turn is actually more uh, organic it is a cyclical being and that they have you know these seasons of growth and I think that that's important because if you take any sort of traditional history class, history is still very much divided and looked at from the perspective of now looking back and now looking back, you know, from the viewpoint that we are at the most present form of history, things are continuously progressing. And in fact, that idea of constant progress and constant growth is something that Spengler calls out as an aspect of Western civilization, which he calls Faustian. Um, but I think that that's the important place to start when we're talking about form and actuality is the difference in historical interpretation. And go ahead, Oren, if you had anything to add to that. No, I, I think that's right. And I think that's what makes him so interesting is he's far less interested in cataloging history uh, in, you know, in kind of the, in the sense that we're used to the more traditional sense. If, uh, if you look at it, he's not sitting there with a thousand footnotes. He's not sitting there uh, pulling in, you know, he's not very interested in uh, showing, you know, how many citations he can achieve. It, it doesn't read like a, a scholarly work today. And that might be from his history teaching might be because he never really fully entered academia. As I understand, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a Spangler. Uh, you know, I, I don't have his biography down. So if I'm wrong about that, then uh, that's, it's entirely possible from what I understand though. Uh, he was not really uh, in that world very heavily. And so he writes a, from a very different perspective and it really is um, more, he, he writes in a man manner that I think takes metaphysics into account more than we're used to from a strict uh, historian, uh, which allows him to tie things about civilizations together in a way that uh, I think your average historian would be limited. And so I think that's something that he brings to the table that's extremely valuable. Yeah, and I mean... And he'll tell you up front in, in the book that he's looking at it from very much a very German perspective. The, the two people that he cites the, the most, I guess, and who he shares his perspective are, are, are Goethe and Nietzsche. And those two that you will hear referenced throughout, particularly um, through Goethe's work, who, of course, if you're familiar with Goethe and his poetry as well as his fiction, um, Goethe talks a lot about... Um, and especially what Spangler references upon is sort of the, the aspect that there's cycles to things, that there are evolutions of things. Things are not static. Things are constantly living. And that's where um, Spangler starts to sort of take in his perspective that history itself is, you know, an yeah, organism. I was, I was trying to, uh, yeah, I was trying to figure that out. I think it's pronounced Gerda. Yeah. Oh, Gerda, I, yeah. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. It's like, I thought it was Gerda, and then you, and then uh, someone pointed that out in chat. Okay. Okay, <laughs> good. To I'm that. totally, yeah. Oh, um, no, it's okay. I, I, I just, I was I was trying to put that together in my mind. Okay. That's my bad. Oh, that makes me even more, ugh, that's, that's bad on me part, because I used to live <laughs> in Germany. I should know that. 
Um, but then again, when you move from Germany to El Paso, you move from one foreign country to the next. So your ability to know things is, eh, you know. My bad, Chad. Thank you for correcting me. Um, but no, to uh, I think it's like chapter three where our, our favorite word that we see on like right wing Twitter gets dropped. Uh, the physiogamic and the systematic um, because yay, physiognomy. Um, but he has this line there when, or he's quoting uh, Goethe himself. A vision is to be carefully distinguished from seeing the act of experience, which is itself history because it's itself is fulfilling that has been lived, which has happened and is history. Every happening is unique and incapable of being repeated. It carries the hallmark of direction, time, of irreversibility. That which has happened there is henceforth counted and has become not with becoming, but has stiffened being not the living, because all that belongs is um, beyond recall to the past. Our feelings of world fear has its sources here. Everything cognizized, on the contrary, timeless, neither past nor future, but simply there. Um... And to me, I think that that's important to sort of talk about because he's sort of breaking down the traditional static view of history. These things are are not things that we can just call upon to say, oh, that this is going to happen again. But in fact, that these experiences are each and in themselves unique because each experience that we have both in history through individuals, uh, even civilizations, as Spangler will go on to describe, are all unique in their own experiences. And it's important to relay those experiences, not just by how we write them down or primary sources, but because each and individual aspect of how we review history is going to be shaped by the experiences of those who actually lived it. Yeah, he definitely treats each civilization as kind of its own thing in a way that I think would bother a lot of people today, you know, especially you kind of have this idea of uh you know americans love to think like well basically you had you know like rome and then like you know the enlightenment tradition and then america right and they just kind of like run it all together as if it's one connected chain and uh spangler says no that that's definitely not the case that even when these different cultures are revivifying parts of older cultures they are necessarily transforming them in a way that is entirely unique to that culture. And so when, even when you see someone pick up an idea from say the Romans or the Greeks uh, and dust it off, when they revivify it, they, they completely alter it and they can't see it the same way that the, the people who even created it saw it. Like even their interpretation of those things is itself new and is imbued with kind of the world spirit of that civilization. Yeah, that's a big part of, of his explanation is that each civilization has kind of its own animating spirit that drives and defines it. And everything that it does is is defined in some way by that spirit. And there's no way to really escape it or live outside of it. And anything that you build will have it kind of running through uh, everything that that civilization does. Yeah, and I mean, he talks about that, especially when he's sort of talking about the what he calls the Faustian culture, what is what is deemed to be the West, especially when he talks about sort of the adoption of um, Arabic numerals and Arabic sciences that we carry back from during the, the Crusade period, and in turn leads to sort of the creation of modern Western science. Uh, and that, of course, without Arabic numbers, not Arabic science, like Western, you know, mathematics, Western science as we know, it never takes off. Leiblin's never sort of works with, you know, creating differential calculus. The, um, you know, even to German thinkers like Gottlieb Fichte never really work off the synthesis principle, although they probably could have due to Hegel. But I mean, each culture, Spengler really goes into depth saying like their own personal perspective, you know, even when they try and revive or bring back the classics or even look towards the past there, it's never, you know, a one for one copy. And, and like he's saying, quoting Goethe there, it's just that, you know, it, these things are their own unique experiences. They're incapable of being replicated or repeated. Yeah. And if you start out the book, like you're going to, it's pretty daunting at the beginning because you're going to go through a couple hundred pages of math and architecture and art. And uh, if that like, <laughs> if that's daunting for you, then, then I understand that. Like when I was like, oh my gosh, I'm really going to read a hundred pages on math. 
Uh, but when you get into it, it's, it's really fascinating because he does a great job of documenting how each one of these cultures looks at uh, math and how their understanding of mathematics is defined by their animating spirit of their culture and how they can't really truly think about mathematical concepts that are not included in their uh, in their worldviews, in their in their animating spirits, and so when you look at like Greek mathematics, they're just you know, as amazing as it was. Like there are just certain things that they cannot get to because of of like how they think and how uh, they see the world. And you know, he says that this extends to architecture, this extends to music, this extends to everything that you see. Yeah, and I mean. Um... And that, and that brings us, I think, to really one of the more interesting parts that Spengler brings up when he's talking about um, architecture, mathematics, and science is, is that every science is more or less dependent upon religion. Um, Spengler borrows the idea, I want to say it's Schopenhauer, I can't remember, I've been going through my notes all day and rereading certain sections, but he's sort of talking about how like what differentiates man from the animal is that we have the ability to conceptualize and Spangler's argument is, is that, like, especially for the Western culture and other cultures as well, like all science and all aspects of our architecture, our art, are just sort of this extension of that conceptualization that we are mortal. And because we are aware of the fact that we die, um, we seek to create things that help us provide understanding. This is where religion, of course, comes from. Um, and those sciences are an extension of that religion trying to understand these questions that we conceptualize that we can't answer. And I know he talks about that, especially in the West with like alchemy. Um, I know he talks about it in great deal when it comes to like Greek architecture. Um, and of course, like Greek, uh, the Greek tragedy, especially. Yeah. And he also talks about how as a civilization starts to run out of steam after, after it hits that civilization stage and becomes rigid um, and and has a hard time adapting and growing and and builds up these structures to keep itself in place rather than growing and becoming something new. Uh, people will actually step away from these these scientific forms. He actually predicts that people will begin to to abandon Western science uh, because it will become too too uh, strict, it'll too too con confining. And they'll need to seek spirit, like real spirituality, somewhere else. And so they'll they'll just stop practicing science. And that's just been one of my favorite things that I ran across in in that volume because it it so perfectly describes what's happening right now in our world. Oh yeah, I mean, there's so much that you can uh, apply to this work that to, to the modern day. And I know there are a lot of people out there. Um, I was reading an article today from uh, this obscure. I I want to if the, you know uh, how on Twitter you have those those globes in the name like the neo lib type. Oh yeah, the globe Twitter. Type. Yeah, 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 globe yeah. Twitter. There's a place called the New Globalist, and uh, they were just like, here's what Spangler got wrong. Um, and they're talking about sort of just like the rise of um religious fundamentalism. Uh, and there is specifically like Islamic fundamentalism. And it's just like, see, like religion hasn't yet like gone away yet. And the sciences aren't there. And it's like, you're, you're getting this backwards. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like the fact that these people are re referring to religion and are, are more inclined to be less secular is all the more indicative that we're, we're at that stage. Yeah. Well, it, well, it's also something to remember is that the, like we said, you know, I think uh, Spengler would say that, each one of these, you know, civilizations is separate. And sometimes, uh, you know, he talks about this in, in the first volume, I believe sometimes the development of a civilization is arrested by the influence of another. And so a civilization will sit in kind of a hibernation stage where it won't fully develop and go through its life cycle. If it's constantly being impacted by, uh, those outside of it. And I think if I remember correctly, it's been, sorry, it's been a little while since I, I wrote everything down, but if I, I remember correctly, he speaks specifically of the Islamic tradition as one of those that would, that was kind of frozen in time due to the influence of others. And then later started to bloom uh, and become its own thing later on uh, after, after it kind of got out under the thumb of, of other uh, civilizations. And so um, I, th I think, some of Spangler's stuff doesn't take gl enough globalism into account, 
But to be fair, he was writing before World War II. And so I don't think he had seen the kind of world spanning, um, you know, uh, neoliberal empire that we we live under uh, today. And it would have been hard to call all of that out. But Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. And I mean, that's the other thing, too, is, is that he does talk about that, I think, towards the end when he's talking about the um, in the chapter about socialism, stoicism and um, uh, and he brings up Islam quite a lot in there. And one of the things that he does mention, of course, is that. Um, you know, the, there, there needs to be space for these cultures to develop. And I think, ironically enough, and, and I'm going to reference Huntington a lot because Huntington quotes Spangler and references him a lot, is, is that um, Huntington talks about Islam and modernity, saying like the big civilizational clash between the two is, is that Islamic countries aren't seeking to do what the West is doing, which is like secularize and modernize their form of religion. It's quite the opposite. It's the inverse where they're trying to Islamicize uh, modernity. And I, I think Spangler probably would be right on the money that we're seeing the, the development of that sort of like high culture, especially as you see nations like Turkey and like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia try to, you know, Islamify, you know, modern aspects of like democratic institutions, things that have now been borrowed from the West, which sort of borrows back to what we were talking about earlier, where these countries can't replicate what they see from the past that anytime that they revivify something or adopt something, they bring upon their own perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And the interesting thing, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see where, what happens uh, with Islam just from an, an academic perspective. I feel like uh, the battle uh, between modernity and Islam is one that Islam is losing pretty, pretty roughly. Uh, I think they're, they're losing that battle pretty hard except for in a few places uh, and even in those places, they're still losing. And now the the question is, would they still lose that battle if you didn't have a global in, glo a globalizing influence like the United States? Uh, would would Islam reassert itself uh, and win that battle if it didn't have the constant pressure from from you know kind of uh, the global empire? I think maybe it would, but I, I don't know. I don't know that they're going to win that one in the end. I think, and I think as Chris O'Hanlon kind of points out in the chat, that they'll win by brute force. And the fact that they've been able to successfully... Uh, see, this is why I think that they'll win. And I think this is why history is on their side. And especially if we want to look at things in a Spang uh, Spanglerian perspective of, like, cycles, um, you have to understand that, like, the, the Muhammad dies in 632 AD. And within 100 years you have conquered the Middle East, most of North Africa, and you are just finally being stopped by the French in the Pyrenees Mountains in 732 AD. So within 100 years, you have this expansive growth, the development of the Caliphate, and an expansive network of trade and empire. And so I think that even with uh, an outside influence, right, from the United States sort of, you know, global empire viewpoint, I still think that they'll manage to hold out. Um, I think they'll have to adapt, and I think that you're kind of seeing that with this development of political Islam in certain countries, whether that's Egypt or Tunisia or Turkey. But the the real question is, is will they it, it, will they survive the global empire? I don't think it's the United States that they need to be asking themselves. It's whether or not they survive China. It's possible. I mean, I, I I'm not as long on China as other people. I think China has its own problems that it, are going to run it off a cliff uh, at some point. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, they're still a growing power. It's they're, they're still a major player. Uh, I'm I'm not. You know, they they've probably got uh, a lot of uh, rubber left on those tires. Uh, but I, I'm I I wonder if China. But anyway, I, I know we're getting we're getting pretty out of. <laughs> Oh, I, I out of mean, field here, but it's the fun part about these conversations yeah. of history is that you have to it lets you speculate. But yeah, the, the China question is a whole other. Uh, we, we've had long discussions on this channel on the foreign policy streams about the China question. Um, I've I, I'm not long on them. I, I'm with you that there's a lot of issues there, but in the meantime, with the Silk Road Initiative, it does make you uh, question as they move through the middle east how they'll handle islam and i i do think that islam has the opportunity to survive civilizationally at least well so this is something that i have been thinking about and i talked to morgoth a little bit on this and so uh probably best to explain the faustian nature so like you know we talked about everybody having you know their own animating spirit and the one that spangler identifies for the west is is the faustian one 
uh, the nature of the Faustian spirit is constantly expanding. It's trying to to reach out and touch things it can't touch. It, it's pushing. And one of the things that uh, that Morgoth and I were speculating on is, does the Faustian spirit, by its nature, change the Spenglerian cycle to some extent because it seeks to push so heavily on other civilizations? Uh, does its does its tendency to reach out and consume and and push out into every you know corner available? Does that at, it, it may not totally change the Spenglerian cycle, but does it not arrest the Spenglerian cycle or retard it or do something to it for other civilizations which are under the constant pressure of, of the Faustian one? Because that's one of the things he identifies. He says, "Look, whatever uh, the Faustian has, he seeks to expand." and universalize. And so he identifies the, the, the need for universalism as a, a product of the Faustian nature. Um, be, be that, you know, Christianity or then now wokeness. It didn't really matter what the system was for him. He thought, you know, he says socialism, he says socialism is going to be the next thing that the Faustians try to, to push to every, you know, to everybody. Uh, but, but he said, it didn't matter what the system was, Fa the the Faustian spirit would drive the West to propel it into like every corner that it could, and so that's just something we were we were we were knocking around. I mean, to me, like especially, I think the fact that he pushed socialism so heavily in the book is what the Faustian spirit pushes. Because I mean, it's the end of the First World War, or at least you're nearing the end of it when he publishes Volume One, and you've already had socialism sort of in the public sphere of like the political consciousness and the body politic for about what 50 years at that point almost and of course you have the red scare in the united states you had massive amounts of like socialist and communist violence during the weimar era i think spengler was sort of right to to call it that at least immediately if what gets pushed i mean the reaction to that sort of violence of course is a conversation for another time but i think I, when he said socialism he might have meant more the welfare state form oh, of socialism well, yeah. I think that I think that's more what he meant when he said because he was because one of the things that that Spangler believes um, is that uh, every every uh, civilization has its own uh, specific form of atheism. I, I did a video on this and and uh, he believes that every civilization uh, has for its it has an animating religion and spirit. And then eventually as it starts to decline and, and it starts to kind of uh, solidify and, be and become uh, inflexible, it develops its own opposing form of atheism. And so he says like Stoicism was the Roman atheism. And he says like Buddhism was the Eastern atheism. And he says the, the, Western, the Western atheism is going to be um, – uh, socialism. And when he says atheism, he doesn't mean like we think of it today. We're like some annoying, you know, internet Reddit guy tipping his fedora. When he's talking about atheism, he means like the despiritualization of the same animating spirit, taking the things that had been metaphysical and vital and trying to, you know, perfect them and make them rigid and, and full of rules and so he sees socialism as basically Christianity without Christ, which, you know, for those of us who have read Bulbug is, is, you know, obviously nothing new. Obviously he did it first. Spangler did it first, but, Sp but Spangler is saying, you know, uh, this is the next, this is going to be the next step because it is the atheism that's going to replace Christianity. This is the, but you know, socialism is the, is the Christian atheism. And that's what's going to be pushed forward. Yeah. And I mean, he says it, I think, quite best here to, to quote him. He says, and every culture thought mounts to a climax, setting the questions at the outset and answering them with ever increasing force of intellectual expression. And as we've said before, ornamental significance until exhausted. And then it passes into a decline, which the problems of knowing are in every respect, stale repetitions of no significance. There is a metaphysical period originally of a religious and then finally a rationalistic cast in which thought and life still contain something of chaos, an unexploited fund that enables them to effectively create, and an ethical period in which life itself, now megalopolitan, appears to call for inquiry, has to turn to the still available remainder of philosophical creative power to its own conduct and maintenance. 
and the one period life reveals itself and then the other the life is an object so yeah that that sort of uh, atheistic or at least what i guess you can consider sort of like the the depreciation of value and wonder of the spiritual there it's no longer the original you know the the gods of you know the classical period he talks about this with like the roman empire uh, like the roman empire took the traditions of the greek gods but they were nothing to the extent of how the greeks worshiped them they they had them only more or less in name only they were just there um he, and that, i think and he talks about that earlier as well but when we talk about that sort of uh atheistic period it's sort of the sign of decline is that it is a rejection of the spiritual and merely sort of a secular scientific. Yeah. And he says this as part of something that might rub people the wrong way, but he says like the Greeks were the metaphysical creative force. They were the, this was the culture in bloom become, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, becoming. And then the Romans are actually the decline. The Romans are the uh, basically taking that animated spirit and they are professionalizing it. They are making it more rigid. They're making it more civilized. But in in the in that uh, process, it's also killing the spark. And he said this. And by the way, he says this is inevitable. He says every culture does this. No one can avoid it. So it's not like he's blaming it on the Romans. He's just saying like this is the natural cycle of it. That like the, that the Romans because they are turning it into something more professional and solid and and serious. And uh, and quantifiable, they are necessarily draining a, of its, you know, kind of that metaphysical magic, that that spirit. And I think you, you know, a lot of people pointed to like this is often, you know, what people point to in America. You know, America is is kind of this of the West is kind of that final. It's it's creating the final civilized form, but at the same time, it's also where the spark kind of dies as the creative passion and animating spirit kind of leaves the the form of the civilization and uh, he mentions this i think when he's talking about the romans being sort of that decline is that there is that sort of cannibalization of prior culture um uh and the 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 best example i think spangler references although albeit lightly and uh, correct me if i'm wrong chat as well as you are in but like he references the aeneid and i thought that this was such a perfect example because it's just like if anyone who's familiar with the Aeneid knows that it is the story essentially of like almost like a, a fan fiction esque spinoff of, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey about trying to come home from the Trojan War and, you know, you end up founding Roman civilization. Um, but it's that, you know, creation and cannibalization of prior tradition and making it your own. Um, and of course, Rome ends up, you know, adopting very clearly from the Hellenistic period. And we can see that decline alter from, you know, well, let's take, you know, Athenian democracy and then we'll create a Roman Republic in which of course that inevitably fails, but that's a, that's a whole other stream topic. Yeah. Like I said, I, I just think it's interesting that he, he shows that that cycle. Uh, and, and this is something that I think a lot of people get hooked on with the book is obviously it's called the client of the West, you know? And so, um, or at least in in the in our translation, and so uh, you know, a lot of people often look at this as like him being down on the state of the West, or him being um, like critical. And I think he's really just explaining a, a process. Uh, he's pretty deterministic, right? Like he 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 says very specifically, like you cannot escape. Uh, your civilization you are part of it you you're you are a a part of the journey of its growth and decline everything that lives is going to die and go like go through this and so decline is just a part of civilizations it's it's not escapable it's it's just something that is going to happen uh and so i and, and so when he's looking at these in states like the romans he's saying look this is just part of the journey like it, it's it's an inevitability you can do it poorly or you can do it well but there's really you know it's going it's going to happen to everyone uh you can't infinitely extend the growth period of your civilization and so much of it is is very descriptive and not prescriptive there's not a lot of solutions in here it's an explanation of how civilizations go through these forms 
Yeah, and those forms, of course, are what he calls um, the, the. He has them as seasons. The four stages: uh, spring, summer, autumn, and winter are the civilizational periods in which we we all go through. Um, and the fact is that he spends a lot of time saying that this is something that you you can't escape, um, and that sort of the the classical Western interpretation of like time and fate are very mechanical we try to understand them through like a formula and through laws and like we measure them but these are things that are beyond just what we write down in in formulas they're very much organic we understand them with symbols and pictures and these gut feelings um and the fact that you know cr things that are chronological there's this idea of destiny that he talks about in, in real uh, detail that I think is important for anyone reading Spangler to understand is, is that the the sort of Kantian view of time and sort of these a priori observations he's just like take all that and like let's just throw that out the window for a second because um, he does spend quite a bit of time like sort of critiquing um, Kant's work like the critique mm -hmm. of pure reason um, and to me the thing that really sticks out is, is that uh, Kant or not Kant, uh, Spangler talks about how like the Kantian view of like time and causality, like these are not just static things. You are very much a part of like your civilization's destiny. These things are inevitable to happen. You can choose to participate or you can choose to try and uh, rationalize yourself out of it, which is what he thinks a lot of the more contemporary thinkers of his time have done. Um, and he, and he, he sort of rejects that overall. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, like there's something about the Renaissance where he says, like, even when you look at like the Renaissance artists and their attempt to like break out of their time, they're simply like reinforcing the nature of their time in their work when they attempt to like go back and bring, you know, these classical influences. And in. like, there's just really no, even if you work to try to escape it, you're just going, like we said, you're just going to take the things that you take from other civilizations and reconstitute them in the form of your civilization. Um, and so that that's certainly part of uh, the journey, I think, for him. And yeah, he's very, he's very critical of this idea that you can become an objective actor outside of the animating spirit or the, the zeitgeist of your civilization. And really uh, one of the things that he points out is, you know, he says that like academics, want to believe that they're like explaining things so other people can follow them. But he says, really, that's the, you've got the causality reverse, like other things happen. And then academics go back and like catalog the things that have already occurred. And by the time they do that, the civilization is already set into a pattern where there's not a lot that's going to grow and change and nothing new is going to emerge. Like by the time the people are there to, show up and write the history and explain it, most of the things, the, the men of action have already made their moves and that period has already passed. Yeah, I mean, he spends the first, the, the introduction of volume one and then chapter two talking about the meaning of numbers is very much a critique of sort of the objective, rationalistic Western way of thinking of looking at history. Um, he is very much critical um, about the idea that you can, um, understand history through this like singular linear narrative of what takes place. Um, it, you know, it fails to understand certain concepts like the will to power or the fact that men will do things out of fear of death, the desire to be remembered um, and things that we will assign meaning to looking from our time backwards rather than trying to put ourselves in the perspective of either a great men who will, you know, take action or, or be, you know, the context of what life was like at that time. And he, his biggest critique, I think, to me at least, was just like, you cannot look back and say, well, things happened because X, Y, and Z, and that is purely it. Uh, it's almost like you, you need to be open to the idea of counterfactual. Yeah, one of the things I noticed that uh, somebody said in the, in the comments is, you know, it seemed very postmodernist. Um, and I think... It, as a lot of people throw that word around, it's not necessarily an inaccurate description of of some of what Spangler is saying. You know, he's saying that um, 
you know, these things are all going to be relative to your civilizations and there's no way to escape that. And um, the way that we look at history, like, like I said, he really objects to this idea of, you know, all these cultures, you know, being looked at linearly and, oh, you know, all these just came from each other. They just built one on top of another. Uh, He does not like that explanation. He also uh, does not like the idea that, um, uh, where was I going with that? Sorry. (laughs) But yeah, he did not like this explanation of, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the arc of history is long and it's always moving in this particular direction. Oh yeah. That's why I was going a wig history. You know, it would certainly, this is a, a certainly a, one of those refutations of wig history where things are always improving and always moving in, in this particular direction. You'd say you're just jumping from particular stages of cycles of different civilizations and treating them as one linear event saying, well, an advance happened here in one culture and then I'm just going to tie a line like a string, you know, directly to the next advancement in a different culture and pretend like that's progress. That's not how history works. Like that's not how actual civilizations work. They, they don't just, it's, you know, the, this idea that uh, an advancement would happen in one civilization and then just would immediately, you know, that would be tied to the next advancement, major advancement in another civilization is an extremely modern concept that has no basis in, in any kind of history. Yeah. Um, and there's a question that got asked in the chat that I wanted to bring up because I thought this would be interesting since we're talking about the animated spirit um, from John. Uh, he sa- I'll put it up here. He says, it's very clear that our America in no way resembles the beauty and sustainability of the de Tocqueville-esque era America. Is there any historical precedent for reinvigorating the animating spirit? So I think that Spangler would say that um, the decline is going to be part of that, right? Like once the spirit is gone, um, your civilization, he talks about the civilizational phase and the civilizational phase is the one in which um, the, the, the society, the, the culture is now done building. It's, no, it's, it's worked out most of its creative energies, its metaphysical energies, it's realized the its form. And now it goes into a mode of sustaining itself through these rigid structures of civilization. So it starts building bureaucracies and, and, and educational institutions and all these things that are going to, that are going to sustain rather than create uh, an, a, a new, uh, animating spirit. And that's going to be, and I think that's where we've been for a while. And then he says that what you see is that those start to break down. Like people get exhausted from living in these strict structures, living uh, trapped in these, uh, these old forms. They feel the call, um, but they can't return um, because the because the the strict structures of the civilizational phase are holding them in place, and so what he says is that you'll see the move towards a second religiousness as the civilization starts to walk away from those uh, those structures, like we talked about with science and those things. Uh, you'll see a return to a second religiousness, but it will not be the same as the original animating uh, spirit. And he says, you'll also see, this is where he famously talks about Caesarism, where you're going to see the civilization, or you're going to see, I should say, because he calls it the civilizational uh, phase. You'll see the culture, you'll see the people of the culture start to look for someone to break them out of these structures, someone to come in and simply, you know, knock down this stuff and return them back to uh, like an or a, 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 a more honest way of living. And that's where he expects to see the Caesar. So I think he would say we're probably more in the second religiousness and Caesar phase, uh, Caesarism phase. We're going to approach that rather than necessarily a new animating spirit of this culture. Yeah. And, and to expand on that, I think it's important to also note that um, Spangler kind of more or less predicted that that sort of decline stage was more or less uh, what was it like 1800 to like now uh, yeah or, yeah around the, right. around the 2000s so a, a 200 year period of sort of this 
decline away from the f- traditional structures of government. I mean, to, and if you want to take it from Spangler's point of view, it's it's 1918 when he puts this out. We've seen now about a hundred years since the American Revolution, the the Napoleonic Wars, and the attempt to recover from that sort of spark of liberalism, which eventually wins out and dominates throughout Europe. Um, so that that era of kings and empire is now on the decline. And you're now watching, and from Spengler's view, a very bloody global conflict bring about that end. Um, so when we talk about you know the, the American aspect of it and reinvigoration, so Spengler would probably tell us that that decline is, is part of the ride, um, like Aaron, Aaron was saying. Um, what, what Spengler would also point out to you, though, I think, is that um, even though you are no longer in sort of that mature fra- uh, phase, there is that sort of push for Caesarianism that, that comes out of it, this desire to break out of this incredibly urban, um, new religious sort of ide- identity that has sort of broken the spirit of the people that were originally there. Because he's talking about that this decline that you're going to witness is high concentration in cities, this new kind of religiosity that is going to cannibalize the old faith in the name of a new kind of spiritualism. And there's going to be disdain for the rural agrarian lifestyle that is necessary to keep that sort of megalopolis afloat. Um, and I, I hate to say that he's right, but we're kind of there. Um, so if you're, if you're looking for some sort of invigoration, uh, reinvigoration, I think that, uh, Spangler would tell you that you you'd have to look towards Caesar, and uh, as Arn and I have also talked about on Twitter, that republics have a, a long tendency to to move towards Caesarianism anyway. Yeah, and and so that's I, I think a really interesting aspect of this is, you know, it's it's tough again. No one wants to hear a lot of determinism, right? And like, no one wants to hear like, "All right, like you're you're just stuck, and this is how it's going to be." Um, but I I do think that, and and to be fair, like I don't agree with every single thing Spangler says, oh, no. uh, but I do think there's a lot of value in understanding the patterns he's just describing because they're very real. Like you're talking about with the cities the disdain for the rural culture. He also says this with, um, with, with, uh, uh, with uh, childbirth, right? He says that, um, that the, the man with many children will become someone of scorn, right? And, and that children will become less important to the civilization. They'll be seen as a burden. Uh, they'll, they'll no longer be uh, thought of as, as a blessing. Uh, they will be uh, pushed you know, to the back burner. This will reduce uh, birth rates and your civilization will also decline in this way. And again, uh, he says, this is just part of the cycle. Like this is how civil, truly civilized people, the people we really like to think ourselves to be the very the extremely complicated, very logical people. Uh, this is what they do. This is their natural cycle. This is where they end up. Um, and, and so when a civilization is in this place, that's, that's what it's going to do. He also though says that it's important that you have people who are keeping the old forms alive, who are keeping them, uh, warm because at some point, even if it's not a, if, even if you will not have a new animating spirit in your culture, in your particular culture that you are in at the moment, the next one will come and, and it's going to be, it may be in a different place. It may be adjacent to your own. Uh, but when it springs up, having those things preserved will be extremely valuable. And so there's, you know, there's still important work to do when you're in those positions, when you're in those phases of this, of, of the culture, but it's, uh, but it, it can, you know, it can be jarring for people to hear that that's at least for him, for Spangler, he thinks that this is just, I think an inevitability. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be blackpilling upon the first read. I can tell you it was for me where Spangler is sort of outlining that this is deterministic. Your definition of destiny and fate are, you know, it doesn't matter what you think. The fact that these things do happen and that these things can be traced in the cycle and that it's done like an organism where things do eventually get old and die. Um, and more importantly, as he's, he's quoting from Goethe, where it's just like, these things cannot be replicated. They are unique in their own set and period of time. So anytime you try and bring it back, it's going to be different. Um, to me, I think that that sort of was telling 
uh, from a historical perspective, because especially for someone who studied history, right, and is on the right, um, there was that debate between Michael Anton and uh, Mencius Moldbug on uh, Jack Murphy's channel, where they were going at the question about American revitalization. And you know, Michael Anton is just like, yeah, I would love for the spirit of 1776 to come back. And uh, even Moldbug and Jack Murphy were just like, that That cannot happen. Um, but however, that doesn't mean that these sort of cultural aspects of what we appreciate about the United States or its cultural identity of like 1776, those things can't be uh, revivified in such a way that we can bring them back for, you know, that are, that are applicable towards a more modern culture. So, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's really easy for a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, especially when we're talking about all the problems of modern day America, uh, to get pretty down on America in general. And I don't feel that way at all. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a proud American. I think there's essential things about this country that are great. Uh, I know that things have gone pretty badly in the last little bit. But I don't think that means that uh, that America did not have very valuable things that came out of it. And I think that just as you could say that, you know, America carried uh, forward, you know, the, the people who had moved to America took um, many of the extremely valuable things of Britain and forged them into something new uh, here and that there was a valuable spirit and, and carrying of some of, the, of that tradition forward while then, of course, making it uniquely American, just like Spengler said it, it, it would be done. I, I don't think that that can't happen again. I don't think that that can't be something that happens. But as, as I think uh, Moldbug and many people have pointed out, one of the biggest problems with reigniting you know, the animating spirit, uh, if we're going to try to cross both, both of these thinkers together, is that um, you don't have the same uh, uh, population that you had back then. Like you, the, the people who founded the American uh, uh, Republic were of much higher virtue, and that's, that's just all there is to it. And it's going to be very hard to to relaunch, you know, this idea of like self-government and these kind of things for people who simply do not have that level of virtue and, and independence uh, that, that once existed. And uh, so, yeah, I, th I think both Moldbug and Murphy were right to, to push back on, uh, on Anton on that one. And, and while I like Anton in general, I think that uh, there, there's a lot of boomer con cope going on there when they're just like, yeah, we're, we're just going to return the spirit of 1776. It's back. Yeah, and I mean, it's the same thing that if we're going to cross these two together, like Spangler talks about that Faustian spirit of expansion. It, that Faustian spirit has, we're, we're in that period now of, of sort of, um, we're in that, that autumn period, as Spangler described it, where that, that spirit is not as vital, as vital or virile as it once was. Like the, the era of manifest destiny and sort of adventurism for, virtuous or honorable reasons is gone and for now the that faustian sort of expansionism and universalism is now very much clashing with the very people that we borrowed those ideas from you know a thousand years ago and it, it brings us into a very difficult position of the the revitalization of the spirit is not something that i think that spangler and perhaps other thinkers would tell you is going to happen easily um, and in fact, he would probably tell you that whatever you borrow from it, it's going to be a symbol that those things are no longer there with you. Um, and he talks about this with the Renaissance, right, in the book where he's saying that like, yeah, the Renaissance is sort of trying to bring back the, the Hellenistic and the Roman era times of art and virtue and their aesthetic appearances. But in fact, the Renaissance would not have happened if it weren't for sort of that... Um, What's the? I think he he specifically talks about um, you know the goth the gothic culture that sort of impacts it, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and it's definitely late gothic culture and the fall of Rome that brings about the Renaissance, not actually classical Rome and Greece itself. Yeah, I might be I might be crossing this up because it's been a while since I read it, but I want to say he said something about like how the Renaissance, like even the sculptors almost look like they were struggling in the most Faustian way to escape their Faustian nature when they were like freeing the forms from the marble. 
Um, I'm trying to remember if I could, it, 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 I feel like there's something like that in there. No, no, he mentioned, no, he mentions the sculptures and he talks okay. about, and he talks about that, especially with the Faustian spirit. I think it's like chapter, I want to say 12 or 13. I could be wrong. Um, I, I'll pull it out in the, in the, from the book in just a second here, but yeah, he talks about the sculptors in, in reference to the Renaissance is that they are trying to uh, escape the fact that they've made that deal more or less. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact is, is that even though they want to go back, they are in turn like cursed with that knowledge, knowing that they're also relying upon other cultures. I think he references Gothic and then Magian, which I believe is uh, Magian cultures or what? Uh, I think he it's the Middle as, East. It's yeah, the Middle Ju East. Yeah, Semitic Middle cultures. East Semitic Judaism. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think it's I think it's interesting that he that he does frame it in that way. Yeah, I mean, he uh, yeah, he talks about it here. He's like, the classical Voss painting in fresco, though the fact had never been remarked, has no time of day, no shadow indicates the state of the sun, no heaven shows the stars. There's neither morning nor evening, neither spring nor autumn, but pure timeless brightness. For equally obvious reasons, our oil painting developed in the opposite direction, towards an imaginary darkness, also independent of time of day, which forms the characteristic atmosphere of the Faustian soul space. This is all the more significant as the intention from the outset to treat the field of the picture with reference to a certain time of day that is historically. There are early morning sunset clouds and the last gleams upon the skyline of distant mountains and the candle lighted rooms, the spring meadows and the autumn woods, the long and short shadows of bushes and furrows. But they are all penetrated through and through with the subdued darkness that is not derived from the motion of heavenly bodies, but in fact, a steady brightness and a steady twilight are the respective hallmarks of the classical and Western alike in painting and in drama that we may not also describe with Euclid and ge geometry as a mathematic of the day and an analysis of the mathematic of the night. And there, I think he's referring more explicitly to the fact that um, these sort of Renaissance painters and artists, you know, despite their attempts to, to create something that is, you know, Hellenistic and classical, it is, even through the simple as, you know, having a time of day, which wasn't around during the art of the classical period, they're inevitably influenced by other people. So one of the things that I found, like one of the better videos recently uh, that was made was Morgoth did a really excellent video about how um, the internet basically arrests culture uh, because uh, you now have access to any time periods culture you want instantaneously. And so that that constant ability to recall culture from any point at your leisure stops people from generating new culture uh, because like you just, you can just pull up like a song from the eighties and then one from the sixties. And while, while you watch a movie from the 90s, like nineties and you're just, you're a wash in an in, in instantaneous uh, resurrection of cultures that doesn't allow basically new forms to take shape. And this is why I'm kind of, I'm stuck on this idea of the Faustian nature of expansion, having arrested cultural development um, and the civilizational cycles. Cause it makes me think like, does this mean that because kind of the, you know, the globo homo, like the, 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 the globalist culture being spread out and the constant availability of previous cultures. Uh, where does, you know, does this mean that until that is broken, a new world animating spirit can't arise in a more global sense, like forgetting, like, because these cultures can't go back and become their own because they're too connected and too continuous and too regularly, um, exposed to each other that they can't even do what the Renaissance painters are doing. They can't even take the past and make it their own because there's no need to create. You can always just draw back um, or, or, or it's being pushed on you. The, the homogenized culture is being pushed constantly and there's nowhere to escape and build. And I wonder if, I wonder if as we see the West kind of decline and its reach uh, kind of returns back to its more natural borders, I feel like that's when we're going to start seeing these patterns reemerge in earnest. And I mean, the, Spangler had talked about that um, 
that autumn period of civilizational decline is going to be a lot of self-referential uh, aspects of culture. There's going to be a culture of nostalgia. And I mean, not to, because I don't agree with Spangler on everything either, but like the fact that our, our culture now, I mean, even like look at, you know, modern day superheroes. What is that building off of? I mean, Joseph Campbell would tell you that modern day superheroes are the reinvention of the myths of old, which of course the myths of old are sort of the religious aspect uh, for the longest time up until I want to say the 60s or 70s. You know, Christ is considered the greatest story ever told. Um, and I think now if you were to ask anybody, it would be Avengers Endgame, um, which is depressing. But I mean, <laughs> you get mo but you get movies like Captain Marvel, right? And it's set in the 1990s. And it's just like, well, why bother creating anything else when you can watch Alice and Brie beat up CGI bad guys to I'm just a girl or Nirvana's Come As You Are? Is, um, the, is there a movie that is less beige paint than that movie? <laughs> like, is there is there something that is that is just more bland? Sorry, but the, that, that movie is just the blandest imaginable formulation of art. No, I, 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 I no, <laughs> there, there isn't. Um, the only thing that uh, to me that comes close and I, the only reason why I don't consider it beige paint is the movie her because, and I don't know if you've seen that one with, um, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, but yeah, 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 yeah. To me that that's beige paint because it's just like, great. You, you have put up a, a sci-fi veneer of what, you know, modernity has done to male and female companionship. But I mean, uh, no, Captain Marvel to me is just the most beige paint cape shit I can think of. But it's the most pure sign of decline because it's like, let's talk about, let, let, oh, there's a blockbuster. Oh, there's Nirvana. There's a Ford Bronco in the scene. You know, like all these pure 1990s nostalgia bait things that just to me is indicative of decline because we're not creating anything new. We're self-referencing. And I think as Morgoth pointed out, like, we're just making sequels and reboots. And I mean, the Disney star Wars is a great example. Yeah. You got me thinking about the movie her now. Cause when I first saw it, I liked it. And now Same. the more, and now the more I think about it, the more you're right, that it is almost uh it's, Oh, in the future, won't it be terrifying that this thing that's already here is going to be there. <laughs> it's like this mentality that is already upon us will be prevalent. Won't that be terrifying? Yeah. No. Yeah, won't that be terrifying that we're going to fall in love with artificial intelligences? Like all like, oh, it's already happening in what China where they have that AI that talks to like 60 million young Chinese men yeah. um, as their digital girlfriend, or that we've got, you know, the simping behavior and parasocial relationships. Like, I first watched the movie and I was like, this is such a great film exploring relationships. And then I get older and I'm seeing all this simping and only fans BS. And I'm just like, Oh my God, this movie was far more on the nose than I originally had thought it would be. And that it, I, I don't like it as much as I used to. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little older than most do in this. And often I think I'm in the last generation that's ever going to have a normal <laughs> like relationship with a human. Um, just by necessity, but anyway, sorry. No, uh, no, but no, speaking you're, of you're, decline of the West, well, yeah. Speaking of <laughs> decline of the West, relationships and whatnot, because I I have this debate often with other content creators who are on the right in like group chats, because like you'll people will jokingly tweet out, and this isn't to call out anybody, because this everyone I think has done it at least once in our sphere that isn't married already, where they'll do that sort of that feel when no GF tweet. And it, to me, it bothers me because it's just like, is it that hard for most young men nowadays? Is there some cultural change that I missed out on that makes talking to women impossible or normal courtship just out the window? Did I miss some major declining moment where that was where that was a problem? Yeah, I think probably, I think because it's, I mean, for one reason, it's basically litigious now, right? Like one wrong move and who knows where you're going to end up. But yeah, I think it's weird to me in some senses because um, I was certainly a someone who kind of uh, grew up, uh, you know, a little, little nerdier and didn't, was, was more socially awkward and then became like more confident and more, more sociable later in life. And so uh, e even I was able to, you know, 
be relatively you know successful romantically with <laughs> with my personality so it is confusing to me in some sense when when it's difficult today but then i also remember what i see you know out there when i'm looking and i uh, you know i'm like uh no i can see i can see why that's where people are that's where people are at the at the moment i can totally understand it in some sense i <sighs> I, I, I guess, and, and not to get too off track here, I get, and I mean, I, this is definitely, I think, something that we can refer to Spangler a lot when it comes to, like, cultural decline, but it's just, like, I didn't have a problem talking, I, I don't have a problem talking to women, I, I think that, you know, you can have a conversation, like, it's not that difficult, and this isn't me trying to, like, be humble bragging or anything, it's me genuinely trying to understand, and maybe it's because, you know, like, fewer and fewer men these days, I think that there's that that aspect of, you know, people maybe not have a father in their life. Maybe the fact that we are way too litigious now with our me too and everything, but it's just very interesting to just see it take place. And I'm just like, I have no problem asking for a phone number or talking to people. And it's just, I, I, I <laughs> you know, not to, not to get too off track. It's just, I think it's an interesting thing to, to explore here as we talk about that cycle of, you know, birth, youth, maturity, decline, and death when it comes to the, the, the these cycles, these basic 200-year patterns of history. Because mm -hmm. um, as, as a comment from here asks, does Spangler explain why powers and nations are de destined to decline? Is it the natural bend of humanity to ruin good institutions? Um, and I, I mean, Spangler very much wants you to look at civilizations organically. Then yes. he spends a very good chunk of that explaining Goethe's concept of the metamorphical that much like a plant's life cycle, um, civilizations have the same life cycle. Civilizations are birthed. They are birthed by a people that have a purpose and they have a nature. They have this identity that is unique to them that seek out a purpose. And for the West, that Faustian um, nature is that our, our desire to expand the, you know, prime phenomenon, the prime symbol of the West is infinity because we wish to expand we wish to know we wish to grow although i would probably argue that traditionally the west's prime symbol is christianity the cross but that's another story um and that and these things inevitably decline due to the fact that they're not the same people that they once were they inevitably reach their maturity by reaching the sort of pinnacle of what their that uh, those initial generations can achieve and then, of course, exposure to other cultures, um, going to war, you know, there's a variety of things in there. But the fact is, is that he looks at it very organically and that it is natural to decline in the same way that it is natural for you and I to grow old and get arthritis. I think he also, uh, when he talks about the civilizational stage, um, is saying, and I, and I think arthritic is exactly the right uh, word to kind of use here, is that when these institutions that undergird the society are formed, they are formed organically. They're formed out of a passion and an animation of the spirit of the, of the civilization. They embody the growth and the, the, the vigorous nature of the civilization. Uh, they are pushing forward and creating things that are of the form of the civilization. As they get to the end of their life cycles, you, they kind of get to that crest, that autumn, and uh, um, and they're um, in the that phase. They're really sustaining. They're they're starting to settle down. They're kind of holding those things in place. But by the, the time you get to the winter, the things that animated those institutions in the first place are falling away. This is why he says that you see this atheism. Uh, 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 you know, the, this this own particular atheism of each animating spirit arise because basically that that atheism is trying to hold the civilization together without the animating spirit. And so it's using a lot of rules, it's using a lot of structures, it's using a lot of bureaucracy to try to hold together the things that were built as the civilization was being born. Uh, it, but it doesn't have the animating spirit anymore. It necessarily strips it out. And so, um, yes, I think you'd say that those things are always going to go that direction, but it's not so much the corrosiveness of institutions, though I think we can make an argument for that so much as just that's it's a natural uh, consequence of the civilization shifting away from kind of its metaphysical animating form. Yeah, I know. It's very blackpilling, isn't it, chat? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but no, um, no, on on that point though, when we talk about, uh, I, I guess sort of the prognosis that he outlines, which is of course, you know, the rejection and the hatred for rural life, the increasing reliance of city life, um, and sort of what he claims to be is the inevitability of Caesarianism in reference to Rome. Um, we're in for a ride, uh, especially as we are in the phase of, of, of death from uh, 2000 to 2200 is what was sort of predicted uh, in that 200 year span. Um, but in, in terms of what is to come and what has happened, I think Spengler provides a very unique worldview that you cannot look at things from a rational objective standpoint. There are anim the animating spirit which drives men and civilizations to do things. And I think that is a very important worldview to have, especially when we look at an increasingly globalized world. Because, I mean, again, this book came out in 1918. The world is just beginning to really experience globalization firsthand. You've got the creation of the Panama and Suez Canals. International travel is becoming more widespread and available by boat and by rail. Um, so they're, they're finally beginning to see what we've been dealing with now for the last, like, 60-some-odd years. Um, and the reason why I think that Spengler is really important for you to, to really take the time to read, because this took me uh, about a month and a half of reading and rereading to get right and to go through notes and to cross-reference things. Like I had to go through my Nietzsche again. I had to go through my Goethe again. I had to um, understand sort of the difference between sort of the Dionysus, uh, Apollonian view of the individual and the collective to, to get this. And I'm not saying this to like humble brag or anything. I'm saying like this is a really important work for you all to understand. Um, in part because when I, we talk about like, oh, the decline of the West, he's talking about this in 1918, it's now 2021, where are we to go from here? And the fact is, is that a lot of the things that he got right are going to be prevalent um, because that animating spirit that once drove these peoples are no longer here. We're no longer the same people demographically that we once were. I mean, you want to talk about like the people that settled America, like the most widespread, like, European ethnicity for white people in the United States are, are Germans, not Irish or English or Welsh or Scottish. So that should tell you a lot about, you know, identity wise, like who makes up who. Um, and, and it's important to understand all that. And I know that this is sort of like a rambly kind of deal about why you should read the book and you should. But the biggest key takeaway about these things is one is that there is something that we uniquely identify that moves us to conceptualize the world around us. And um, you know, Spengler talks about that with it being religion and the awareness of our own mortality and that inspires us to move. So I think the fact that we are as human beings cognizant of like civilizational mortality, Spengler provides us an avenue to both understand what is to come and sort of how to survive it. And I think that's the most important part there. Yeah, no, I would agree. And and I've, you know, I've, I've talked about this before. A lot of people will look um, at uh, Spangler or, uh, you know, some, some of the guys I'm a fan of in the, in the NRX uh, circles. Uh, and they'll say, you know, this is just a lot of predictions of like doom and gloom. Uh, but I think that there's a, a an extreme value in understanding what's going to come next. And I also think it's really important to realize that many people leave, lead perfectly good, fulfilling, uplifting, valuable lives in declining empires. Um, I think that some of the greatest works of history, I think some of the greatest art, I think some of you know, and I think a lot of really powerful things can come out of those moments and times. I think that the things that you're going to do, uh, you know, the the forming of a family, the uh, the the you know creation of a community, uh, the, you know, the commitment to your religion are going to be valuable no matter where you are in the civilizational cycle. And so I would say that while we do spend a lot of time. Um, looking at patterns and using them to explain what's happening and uh, so that we have a better grasp on things, don't get stuck in the idea that this means that this is like doom and gloom for you. Uh, you you're, you know, many, many people live very valuable and, and important and fulfilling lives in the in these kinds of times. And don't think that just because 
we're predicting a particular pattern of history to reoccur doesn't mean that you, know, you, you are unable to you know, have success and, and fulfillment in your own personal life. Yeah, and I mean, the most important aspect about all of this is that even if even if you were to fully buy on to Spengler's analysis and think that like the the worst is to come, the the death of Western civilization is nigh, that there will be eventually some other civilizational power that takes that culture or takes the remnants of the West and um, synthesizes something new, sort of what he describes, a uh, fixed synthesis principle, he describes that in the book. Um there is still much to be done in order to one, you know, live a healthy and meaningful life. Um, but again, I think that that comes back to the conversation that you and Morgoth were having about the Faustian spirit, either holding back cultural development or potentially even holding back cultural decline. Um, and I think that'd be sort of a, a good way to, to wrap things up with sort of our own personal critiques of, Spangler and um, what what is to come because there's a lot that he gets right, but there's also a lot I think coming from a non-academic perspective and a non-historian perspective. I think it's also important to acknowledge. Um, and, and for me, I think one of the things that is important when you know criticizing Spangler, or at the very least, you know, taking some objections, is is that um, you know. Even if I were to be convinced that his, you know, development about youth, adulthood, maturity, and decline, um, you know, he doesn't talk a lot about these patterns in other cultures. Like, he doesn't really go into depth about Semitic culture or, or what he calls the Magian culture or even, like, Mexican or Pan-American culture. Um, he's very selective in his application of his own pattern. Because, I mean, if you were to take a look at Magian culture, right, like Islam and Judaism are still alive and well and arguably thriving in their respective parts of the world, especially with, um, you know, with Judaism, despite what has happened historically. You know, they're still around. They're still thriving. They're still within, you know, positions of, in, of authority within their own government and influence on the world stage. And Islam is still a force to be reckoned with, despite being around for a significant length of period of time. Um, so do not think that the pattern is applicable to all civilizations or his time frame is applicable to all, um, you know, even, even here in the West. Because even Rome had significant periods of, um, you know, peace and, you know, differences between the time of say Caesar and the four good emperors. Like you, we may be in a lull point before either some sign of Renaissance or some kind of restoration. Yeah. So interestingly with both of those examples you pointed out, I think you are right in general that uh, he, he is, he does pick and choose how he applies this formula. And so he'll point to China. He'll point to the West. Uh, he'll point to India at specific times, but he tends to, to kind of pick and choose as well when he's forming that narrative, which, you know, that's how narratives work. So I do think you're right that that is a criticism to keep in mind though. The ones, the two that you mentioned are interesting because those are both civilizations that he explains will act differently. Right. Yeah. Uh, cause, cause he says that the, because the Semitic culture is necessarily uh, uprooted uh, it, it will, because it is a culture that is, is always uh, mobile and is not uh, fixed in one area. It will. It has its own life cycle, which he explains. And then the Islamic culture, he you know that that's um, the Magian culture. He explains that that one was what, like he said, was frozen in its development uh, due to the pressures of outside cultures, and so it will go through its own unique. Uh, version of the cycle because it kind of uh, it was like half formed when it was kind of frozen because of influences of other cultures and it has to wait before it has its own uh, you know but, but it had to wait for it to kind of begin its life cycle anew um, so so he does have explanations for both those cultures though I think your overall critique of him picking and choosing when to apply the formula I think is correct yeah, and maybe it's my own bias coming in for the fact that we're living in a different time period than Spangler is, because, like, 
you're right. Spengler's right. Where he, these civilizations are definitely have outside pressures and influences affecting them, especially the Middle East. After centuries of European pressure, you had the Eastern question, um, of course, the Crusades. But like, uh, imagine how much of a rapid development. So I guess what you could say, like the Magian culture, has undergone since post World War One. Right, the Ottoman Empire falls. These borders are carved up, and they are more or less have stayed the same since 1919. Um, and, and so that I think what we're seeing now is that rapid sort of catching up of development. And I think with how they're, you know, trying to Islamify modernity from a Western perspective, to me, makes me wonder how accurate, you know, even Spangler's analysis of their, of their life cycles are, are going to be. Um, and then the other thing, of course, would be with um, the, the, the Magian thing, not just with Islam, but also like Judaism, just... They have their own country now. They have an incredible amount of influence on the Western world as well as the Middle East. Um, and, and the fact that they're so, um, I guess for the lack of a better term, ethno-narcissistic, you know, they'll, I think that their, their preservation culturally will go on for quite some time. Um, but of course, to me, I always, I, I, what I find the most interesting thing about those two cultures specifically, at least with Spangler, is that um, Spangler spends a really long time um, talking about how Christianity would not develop the way that we know it if it wasn't for these civilizations, which in turn shapes the West. Uh, and to me, that's really important to keep in mind there is just how much of, a, of an Arabic and Aramaic influence exists within Christianity. Yeah, and he also points out, um, and you can take or leave this part of Spangler, but he, he points out that Christianity in its... Uh, in its uh, um, Magian form is vastly different from Christianity in its Faustian form. Oh yeah, a uh, and so this is where he says, you know, you it, it, when it when when Faustians pick up Christianity, just like anything else, they fundamentally transform it into something different. Um, and so what we see as Christianity today is is very much the the Faustian uh, metamorphosis of Christianity in in his view. Yeah, and I mean, keep in mind that there are other things to to consider as well with um, uh, with Spangler, like Spangler's view towards um, women, which I mean, to me, uh, Spangler's critique that like civilization is in decline is because more and more women are like the the unhappy housewives of Henrik Ibsen, which I mean, I wonder how Spangler would definitely react to how women are today, um, <laughs> but. Uh, no, I, I I think that it's important when we when we we take a look at this book, especially uh, volume one, that there there the the key factors to consider are there's an animating spirit that pushes civilizations to act a certain way. The West's idea is what he considers Faustian that we have this desire to be uh, universalizing, expanding, and gr having this infinite track towards growth, um, and that the the prime symbol or the prime phenomenon of the Western people. Uh, which is Western Europe and the United States, is that of the symbol of infinity. And these symbols, of course, are derived from, you know, cultural integration and assimilation of other ideas, whether that's uh, Arabic numerals, Hindu symbology. Um, those are, those. Are, that's important. And then lastly, it's important to examine history and a organic organism view of birth, life, decline and death um, within a 200 year cycle. Uh, it is an incredibly thick read um, and it, it'll take time, but there's some really great notes out there. And I would recommend that you guys take a, a good read at this book because there's a lot to, to take in. Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly a commitment, but I would say that uh, of the things I have uh, read so far this year, uh, Spangler is easily uh, the most, the one that I have returned to most often and turned over and over in my mind. I think that, uh, I think that while obviously, let's see, like we both said, he's not right on everything. I think there is so much here that is spot on predictive in an almost scary way. It's, it reminds me of when I first read unqualified reservations, to be honest, it reminds me of the first time I read mold bug where I was like, uh, so this guy called the shot like decades out. Well, Spangler called the shot like a hundred years out um, and did a very good job. And I think he makes a very good case. 
he's not right on everything, but when he's right, it's uh, it's pretty accurate and I think pretty essential. Yeah, th- this is essential reading to understand uh, history in sort of a non-academic way in a cultural and more importantly, I think, metaphysical narrative. Like if you want a different sort of uh, epistemology of how to view history, not just sort of like this mechanical like, oh, things move in this linear direction of X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, the rejection of Whig history, as Mold Book likes to call it, like Spangler is essential reading. Whether you consider yourself a reactionary or someone who's on the right, uh, he is required reading. Yeah, I would definitely say even if that's, if you're not somebody who is, who's like seeing yourself as a reactionary, just having this perspective is, is pretty essential. Oh, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, so with that being said, I think that that's a, a good place to, to at least wrap up our commentary. If you guys have any questions, um, I'm sure that we can take a few for the next f- five or ten minutes or so, and then we'll do some shilling, and then we'll uh, take up the rest of your time and give you back your evening. <laughs> Well, it's not my stream, so uh, I can do this. Uh, guys, throw throw the Prudentialist to super chat. He he deserves it. Uh, oh well, I, we're, I, I, I've only applied for monetization. I am not yet. Oh, super, okay. You I am not it. super chat oh, okay. capable just yet. All Although right. one day I will be, as soon as Google AdSense says, "Hey, I can, I can take super chats." But don't don't worry. There's a tip jar on Subscribe Star, so don't you worry there. But okay. if you guys have questions, by all means, just ask. And uh, I'll, I'll put them up and we can have a good conversation about them. Um, but yeah, uh, Louis Le Prudent says, the problem with Western civilization is that its expansion has been used by the progressives to pretty much blanket the entire world and destroy everything interesting out there. Uh, um, I mean, that, I, I think that's the problem with, I guess, progressive or liberal universalism is, is that in our desire to make things like us in our Faustian spirit to understand things and to make it our own. Um, we often undermine the sovereignty of other countries. Um, it, ironically enough, the greatest I- irony I think about sort of the Western tradition of foreign policy and practice is, is that you get the peace of Westphalia, right? That ends the 30 years war. That's sort of the, the conceptualization of modern history or modern statecraft of like respecting the internal sovereignty of a country and its borders and not to intervene in domestic affairs. And then we look towards the outside world of what's not considered Western and we completely disregard our own tradition. So to me, that's the, that's the real irony there. I think about sort of progressive universalism. This is that we don't even universalize our own values towards other cultures. Yeah, like I, like we said before, I think the the universalism is sim- is simply uh, part of the Faustian nature. Whatever it is, it was going to be universalized. When it was Christianity, it was it was going to be Christianity, and when it became progressivism, it was going to be that. Um, but I don't think it's a function of necessarily either one of those so much as it is uh, the the nature, as you would point out. Yeah. Uh, Dan Normie asks, uh, what changes would you make to Spangler's theory of history, or do you reject cyclical theories of history? Um, I, I I think that it would be important to acknowledge that um, if there's any changes I would make to Spangler's theory of history, I think it would be important to acknowledge that um, other civilizations and other cultures and other, you know, animating spirits that move people... Um, they do clash and they have conflict, which is why I reference Huntington a lot on this stream and others. Um, and I think Spangler acknowledges this, that, hey, the West has interfered with some civilizations and other cultures, but he doesn't talk in too much detail of how those other cultures interact with the others. He doesn't talk too much about how, um, you know, what in f- effect does like Indian numo- numerology or symbolism affect like the Chinese or affect the Magians. Um, I, I would definitely like him to have gone in more depth about that. Um, if I reject, do I reject cyclical theories of history? No, not necessarily. Um, I, I do sort of hold on to the belief that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And there's good reason for that. And I mean, even the short lifespan of American history tells you that too, because you have eras of, you know, um, decline of religiosity and then you have these great awakenings and then you have these declining periods of sort of secularism. And we've seen that before in the United States where 
you had a gilded secular era of commerce and sort of this ideology of just like laissez-faire things, which of course leads to the, this progressive era that is also underpinned with this sort of resurgent religiosity where you get like the temperance movement and eventually prohibition. I think that you're kind of seeing that happen here where there is a um, marketing sort of religiosity that's also now being underpinned by sort of this reaction to what's happened. So you're seeing that underpinning reaction of religiosity, especially from the right. Um, Cause you know, for years, the, the right wing in the United States sort of slowly moved away from, you know, sort of the Christian right ideas that are, there, there was that weird flirtation with more of a secular libertarianism. Um, but now that's sort of coming back. And I think that that is indicative that there's a, a cyclical theory of history to be considered, or at least I hold to it. Yeah, no, I, I would not reject his cyclical history theory at all. I think there's uh, a very large amount of, uh, of value in that. If I was to make one change, I think it would be what you were talking about, where I don't think that he explains thoroughly enough or goes into enough uh, understanding of what the impact of other cultures are on the civilizational cycle when 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 cultures do clash what that has he do, he does explain it some uh when he talks about the magians being arrested by uh, influence of other countries but I, I do think that he he the reason he spends so much time in some of those you know particular civilizations and you know treats them as his high civilizations are they are the ones that were dominant enough to complete cycles um, and I don't think he goes enough into ones that were not dominant enough to complete their own cycles and instead were heavily impacted by a more dominant high cultures who were doing so. Hmm. The Mad Mercenary asks, uh, at the Prudentialist, good stream, man. Um, my question, do you think with modern technological changes that has quickened Spangler cycle? So instead of the process taking 200 years, may it take 85 I would say yes. I, th I think that uh, they absolutely do uh, increase the rate of this, though um, uh, I also think that because of that, we're I, I <laughs> many people have this uh, disagree with me, but I think that we are pushing towards the edge of sustainability on the speed at which these th kind of things can increase. And eventually, once we hit that wall, we will return to a more natural cycle. Um, but I think right now, yeah, we are absolutely seeing the shortening of those cycles. Oh, yeah. And I mean, um, Moldbug talks about this, too, in Unqualified Reservations. I think he calls it the Q factor about um, the impact of which, like, our technological development affects our political and, like, cultural, like, changes as well. And talking about how, like, well, you know, societies have to change incrementally, like the changing technology, like life still gets better. Um, but I mean, I think that it definitely does speed things up. Each, each sort of new technology definitely can adhere to things. So like not to get too spicy, right. But a lot of people will tell you, or like some counterfactual historians would argue that it wasn't necessarily like the invocation that slavery was going to die out on its own. It was sort of like, no, the technological changes due to the cotton gin would like create economic outside pressures that would accelerate the sort of like the pro-slavery, anti-slavery divide in the United States. So, like, yes, technology does have a huge impact on it. Um, and I, I also share Aaron's perspective that eventually it, we're going to get past a point of sustainability and the, the speed and rate at which we move, it, we're not going to be able to react to it effectively. Um, uh, someone that I reference a lot on Twitter and in other conversations is uh, the French postmodernist philosopher Paul Virilio. Uh, Virilio comes up with the concept of the integral or the original accident, to where eventually with each new discovery, the faster you accelerate upon sort of like a technological tree, the likelihood that you're going to create like an accident or some sort of catastrophe that is going to irreparably change society and most likely for the, you know, for not for the better. And odds are we're probably already there. Um, and it's not going to be a very good way of being effective. Um, it's not sustainable. And I think unlike Virilio, I think we're already there. Yeah. And uh, this, you can see this in Nick Land's accelerationism too, right? He talks about how each increase of the speed of the cycle makes it more and more impossible for humans to actually be part of the decision-making cycle uh, that, that basically uh, in his explanation, you know, capital and technology are just exciting each other 
in a way that starts to leave humans out of the loop uh, and decisions get made uh, by themselves, basically decisions make themselves. And once you, once you've completely unmoored uh, the, the social and technological decision-making process from the needs of humans, you're just ready. It's only a matter of time before things just spin off. Yeah, but I mean, isn't Nick's whole position on that though was to like just just steer into it? So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just no, his, solution, his solutions are terrible, <laughs> I mean, but his predictions are correct. Like, uh, yeah, like no, yeah, I, I do not accept the uh, the robot over- overlords that Nick does, but I think his diagnosis of of how that occurs is correct. Yeah, his his, his proposed solution I think is terrible, which is funny because he he tweets like such a boomer con now it's just like what happened to nick land in the last like five to six years i'm gonna be honest as somebody who read fanged numina i prefer boomer con nick <laughs> like, like i prefer oh, that, comprehensible that, that's, nick land that, that's next on my reading list i've been told you can't understand it sober uh yeah that's that's accurate um <laughs> I would say there are four essays, maybe five out of there that are essential reading. And then you're probably doing yourself a favor if you skip the rest, to be honest. Like the dark enlightenment is Nick Land's real uh, uh, essential work. Um, there's, there's more in the dark enlightenment uh, than there is in the entirety of Fang Numina by orders of magnitude. Though I do think you do get valuable things by reading parts of Fang Numina. Uh, but but yeah, if you're if you want to read valuable Nick Land, read, read uh, that's like actually readable. Uh, you know, Dark Enlightenment. Uh, you know, gu- his his quick and dirty guide to uh, accelerationism. Uh, his stuff. His his kind of play. Nick Land is always best when he's building on somebody else's ideas. So like his Dark Enlightenment is an excellent counterpiece to unqualified reservations like him building off of spandrel's iq shredder is the best part of iq shredder uh but land is always best when he's working kind of off somebody else's stuff rather than like when he's just trying to build his stuff from the ground up yep and i think on on that note uh louis the prudent asks r mcintyre so nick land is like the reactionary version of a bullshit social studies professor uh yeah i i guess like i i i Look, I think I, I I really like Nick Land's stuff. I think it is incredible when it's valuable. It is extremely valuable. Um, ironically, like the parts of the Dark Enlightenment that he pulls from Moldbug and then expands on are often more valuable than what Moldbug was saying in those parts. So I'm I'm in no way decrying Land's work. I'm just giving you. I'm just saying. If you go through Fang Numina and you read it page for page, you might be wasting some of your time. <laughs> there you go. There, there's the answer. Yeah. I, if you haven't read The Dark Enlightenment or his gentle introduction to accelerationism, you you need to. Those are, I think, required in RX reading, uh, along with his IQ Shredders uh, stuff that he, he bounces off Spandrel. Um, and if you're also one of those like cinephiles, then you'll love following him on Twitter. I think, uh, yeah, he has down here. Uh, Nick Land is like butter, only healthy as a supplement. Yeah, there, that's, exactly. That's there the best. You go. There yeah, you it's, go. It's not a good diet, but it's it, but it's got some benefits as a supplement. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, well, with that being said, um, Aaron, do you have anything that you would like to shill or let the audience know that you've got coming up for everyone? Uh, just you know, just the channel and the Twitter. Uh, if anybody's you know uh, not subscribed over there, please please go do that. Um, I'm a little behind. I've got video ideas, but I've been uh, uh, doing a lot here in the last week. Uh, video production's been a, on a hold, so hopefully I'll have something coming out in the next week or so. But uh, but yeah, just just the channel. If, if anybody uh, wants to follow follow that, go ahead. Yep, and his channel is linked in the description of this stream. So if you are not uh, following Aaron on Twitter or any of his other social media and his YouTube channel you should be following him and you should be subscribing to him. He does such an excellent job at breaking down sort of reactionary and NRX concepts into digestible, easy to understand videos, really a great compendium of just to understand dissident right thought. So you should definitely be subscribed. Um, as for this channel, well, thank you all for showing up and watching to us, listen to talk about the angry German historian and uh, tune in tomorrow afternoon at 12.15 p.m. CST for the Sunday stream. 
our wonderful foreign policy and analysis uh, show. And we'll be talking about um, offensive realism and John J. Mearsheimer. So it's also kind of like a book report, book review, like today's uh, video uh, stream was. And then after that, I will be having a video on strategy and tactics because I had my backers ask me for my opinion on a little bit of the uh, discourse going on in our circles. So I, I put together a video on that. And uh, that's what we've got going on. So I hope to see you all tomorrow. Go subscribe to Aaron if you haven't already. And thank you so much for, uh, for coming on. And um, be prudent, everybody. Thanks for stopping by.